Hello, good people. At the time of this recording, Magnus Carlsen remains the greatest chess player on the planet. And as extraordinary as Grandmaster Hikaru is, in this generation, Magnus is the one. But you're not here for just a Magnus game. You click that link because you are curious if this video can improve your chess playing strength and in turn upgrade your chess ELO. I hope to do just that. Let's get to it. So this game took place in 2006 at Oslo, Norway, when Magnus Carlsen was only 15 years old and was destined to play against the final boss of the Norwegian Chess Championship in the form of Grandmaster Simon Edgestein, which I probably butchered. I'll highlight and show the key concepts that I hope would boost my rating points and my playing strength and yours as well. Oh, before I begin and before I forget, if you do like this content, please leave a like and subscribe. Let's get to it. GM Edgestein plays as white and Magnus plays as black. White starts with c4, the English opening. Magnus plays a knight to f6, conquering these squares or just filling them up. Knight to c3, e5. Whereas white tries to expand on these light squares, black expands on this side of the board. Knight to f3, attacking the pawn. Magnus plays a knight to c6 e3. Idea is her pushes here on d4 attacking at once, twice, and three times. And here Magnus plays bishop to d5. Idea is quick castle but also just threatening the possibility of ruining the pawn structure of the opponent and or pin if this gets pushed. And here the opponent plays knight to d5, the first kind of error very slight inaccuracy in the game, tries to complicate the game. Um, white could have just simplified and played queen to c2, and if takes, takes. No structure is ruined for white. But after this move, uh, white played knight to b5, uh, knight to d5, uh, threatening to take this, but also uh, having taken the center, Magnus just casually, I don't know how casually he moved the piece, but casually, a bishop to e7, just retreating the knight back, also protecting here, and a3 was played, trying to expand here, uh, telling Magnus you might not want to put your bishop there again, of course you can't because the knight is here. And here Magnus seizes the moment, takes up space, and plays e4. And here white is uh, in a, a bit of an awkward position because this knight needs to go somewhere because it's being attacked not here of course because that's bad simply takes and you take it and not here because that's kind of the <laughs> the structural rule is not to double your pawns unless there is an advantage or compensation for it so after takes takes black and simply take on d5 and then now you have triple the pawn chain you have less development and that's just very bad. That's very hard to play when your pawns are in a single file. Um, yeah, that's bad. So that didn't happen in the game. Instead, after the e4 push, his opponent just played uh, knight to g1. And if you can notice, and the first thing I'll, I want to talk about is development because of this complication that uh, white tried to make now all his pieces are back in the original squares. Magnus has more territory and he's going to castle next. And that's what he did. He castled next. So the very first thing I'm gathering from this game, and I'd like to share with you guys, and also a note to myself is, number one is always development, development, development. Uh, Magnus' pieces are centrally placed and the king is safe. White, who has the first move, and having done this complication, has a uh, is in the middle of the board. The white king is is not safe. Um, still equalish according to the supercomputer, but uh, between two humans, this is just bad for white. And here, uh, white plays queen to c two, just trying to attack that pawn, trying to gain some ground. And here, Magnus just plays principal chess. And that is aiming at the center, but also willing to protect this pawn, activating the rook. Knight to e2. The knight had moved back to g1 and now casually um, needs to develop. But there is delay in this in this motion. So 
and I'll show you guys why. Knight to e5 was played. Now, because Magnus already seized these light squares, he wants to clamp down even more on a d3. Just, just you know, you guys know how Magnus plays. He's he's a supercharged Karpov and Fisher. He's no he's no Kasparov. He's no uh, he's no Misha Tal. He just squeezes position. He, his tactics are very good. I'd say Hikaru's are probably slightly better. But he just knows the, the game well, and uh, yeah, here. White takes knight to f6, bishop takes on f6, and that looks like a free pawn. This is where Magnus sets up a trap. Uh, and it's, it's between grandmasters, but also it's, it's good to, to think about it uh, between, um, as normal humans, mere mortals, because the opponent doesn't take, and instead plays knight to c3, attacking it twice. If the queen took... Well, it's not so easy because Magnus just plays d5. And yeah, this game is insane because if queen takes, that's very bad. After takes, takes. Notice how weak that square is and you king can't move here. So after that, you lose a rook with a nice fork. And if, say, a queen took and the grandmaster sees it with d5 and it says it takes here, Magnus has this very nasty bishop to g5 the idea being if the queen hangs out in that square say plays this or something then any check here means that the queen is on pre and is lost so after say d5 takes bishop two queen moves out of the way because the opponent's not an idiot <laughs> queen takes knight to c6 uh, what you can see is that black is up in peace activity, and I'd like to highlight that out, actually, even though this variation was not played, Magnus was calculating this line. If you can see, uh, white's pieces are still in their original squares, and Magnus's pieces, even though this is an outright winning, this is much more playable for black, as you can play your rook to d8, uh, moves to develop, Basically, your bishops are unleashed like krakens, and and yeah, this is easier to play as black. But in any case, the opponent didn't take. Instead, played uh, knight to c3, and here Magnus plays d5 anyway. And the idea is, after takes, he plays bishop to f5, basically developing the bishop, but also protecting this pawn. Um, you you know you can't take. If you, if you do other moves like, say, d4, just ignoring that, well, simply en passant, you cannot take because it's attacked multiple times. And, uh, oops, and if you play d3, same idea, simply takes. If you play bishop to e2, ignoring the fact that there is a pawn breathing down your neck, then you, knight to d3 is played, and after takes, takes to b3 this pawn is just a complete complete monster again you're not developed so at this point i'd like to highlight the second idea of this uh, maneuver that magnus made with bishop to f5 and that is to control the central squares guys the central squares and all of magnus's pieces right now apart from uh, number one being developed first He's got very good control of the central squares. He's got a pawn pushed in the fourth rank and also controlling, controlling, controlling the central squares, guys. So one thing I'm taking away from this game, development, actually two things I lied, development and central squares. And here, uh, white is in a bind, like I said, uh, but white also realizes that it's you need to get rid of that pawn. So he plays knight to e4. And here, Magnus plays this awesome, awesome idea of bishop to h4, just pinning the f2 pawn there. Um, the king is two tempos behind and is also potentially gonna be x-rayed here. Um, and also, if you can take a note, the queen is, is pinned at this time. Very, very harsh times for the white position here. Uh, and you can't ignore it. If you play a g3, that's so bad because your light squares are completely destroyed, so you get knight to f3 now. And after that, goodbye. Hit here, but your queen is on prees. Um, if you play d3, 
simply takes. Now bearing down on this, your king is undeveloped. You, you lose much more tempos, and after say g3, same idea. And here you can actually take with the rook. The rook! Because after takes, you hit the queen. These All these squares would lead to checkmate. You have to give up your queen here. Because after that move, it's checkmate. Anyways, here, just simply, yeah, just brilliance from Magnus. So this is a trap and a half. And if you try to counterattack with, say, bishop to b5, hitting this, it does not work. Um, because Magnus calculated all the way just with a simple queen 2, hitting the pin here. This is also hit. So after, say, knight to c3, thinking, hey, I'll attack the queen first, Magnus has prepared that idea. And if, say, you don't take, you take here first, you take the queen next, you have to take here and then give up your uh, knight, because if you get greedy, then that's a check and a mate. And Magnus, even though he's super positional, also knows his tactics. It's absolutely beautiful. So anyways, back to that move. Bishop to h4. All the traps. All the traps by Magnus. Queen to a4, unpinning the queen, uh, protecting and potentially trying to hit that, but that is protected by the queen. So, queen takes on d5 with tempo, developing the queen and hitting e4. Knight to c3 was played. And here Magnus just retreats. This needs to develop. The king is protected by one pawn, but is in the middle of the game. And here d4 was played. It looks like, hey, maybe this barricade helps, but Magnus, Magnus plays a simple knight to d3. And the idea is you, you can't move your king because that gets sliced, but after you take, which is what the opponent did, bishop to d3. And I'd like to highlight this idea of uh, the bishop pair. The bishop pair plus impeding your opponent's development. Uh, in this position, white or black doesn't have central pawns, but the position is wide open, meaning the bishops can and cause massive damage, and the rooks are open. So let me highlight that as number three, um, the diagonals by the bishops, and semi or uh, open files. So that's the third thing I'm getting from the game. Magnus doesn't uh, switch from kind of taking the center, and then just blew open the middle. And in this position, white cannot actually castle at all. It's really sad. There's a pin here, and also completely underdeveloped. The game continues with bishop to d2. Somehow white has to develop, even though this is blocked. So, <laughs> Magnus plays b5, and now he rips open the sidelines here because the king is in the middle. So if, say, knight takes, then he hits the knight twice, hits this, hits the pawn, and if you, say, play g3, well then Magnus just hits the queen first with capture, and then threatens checkmate. It is ridiculous how Magnus establishes that. Um, just complete barbarism. Um, if say queen to d1, well then you hit here. After that push, yeah, uh, king's in the middle of the board. Bishops are slicing everywhere, and hence I'm trying to uh, explain how magnificent the strategic idea of open files of two bishops in an open position. And this is an open position, all for blocks taking. So. So after b5, uh, the grandmaster opponent saw how crazy the position can get and advantage for black. Uh, queen to b3. Queen simply took here now. Open. Open files, guys. And because of that, there's a pin. Of course, you can't take because otherwise that would not be chess anymore. In uh, kind of getting sick of being stuck in the middle, uh, white castled queen side. And here, uh, queen 2 c5 was played, just developing there. g3 now, trying to gain some ground. But first, but first, of course, the intermits a move, bishop to c4, hitting the queen. Reshuffling the bishops here. As you can see, uh, black has nice controls of the diagonals. The diagonals. 
king to b1. Now you get e5. I'm trying to bust open ideas again of opening the files. f3 was played. Idea likely of knight to e4. But now you have rook to d1. The king moves b4. Just, just opening. And this idea of can opening that uh, diagonal again with the pin. So knight. And here Magnus plays rook takes on e4. But the Magnus sacrificed the exchange or the rook. The fourth concept, which is quite concrete, is idea of tactics and calculation. I'm quoting Fisher indirectly, and he said, good tactics are born out of superior positions. When he talks about superior positions, superior strategic positions. In this position, you have the slicing bishops and this active pin. You can't ignore it. Magnus plays a bishop to d3. And of course, his opponent is a 2500 player. And this is why practicing tactics is also important to see the finish, because if his opponent ignored the threat, then Magnus can sacrifice the bishop. And after it takes queen to c2, you have this very subtle but unstoppable checkmate. And of course, his opponent had seen that, and after bishop 2, d3 tries to hit the queen back. Magnus takes equalizing exchange, but it's not an equal position by uh, any stretch of imagination. And after takes, bishop takes on e4. After takes, you have this double pawn structure. And Magnus takes another pawn, maintaining the pin. h4. Magnus stops any counter player space advantage. Rook to f1 trying to get rid of this bishop, but Magnus maintains this pin. And after f6 here, uh, white simply resigned. And you might be wondering why. Well, let's see the finish here. After, say, king to a2, takes, takes. You can pin here. And the game is done. The game is simply over. You see all these pawns? Because white needs to defend this idea, and there's two passers. Black will completely wreck and take all those pawns. So say, king to f7, king to a3, takes, takes, takes. You have to contend with these two passers, which you actually can't stop. And also contend with the king that's about to take all your pawns. And yeah, you can't, you can't. It, you guys can see and visualize that this game is over. So Magnus switched from simple principles to Tactics, tactical traps, and then just liquidated the end game, Magnus, Super Karpov style. So guys, quick recap. In this game, Magnus, the 15 year old Magnus, at only 20, 2675 strength, demonstrates uh, four key concepts to hopefully improve your game, and hopefully, and I can, I can incorporate to my game. And that is, number one is development. Number two is take to central squares. Development. For yourself and then taking away the development of your opponent and while doing that having central squares when you have your pieces developed open the diagonals and open the files to maximize the efficacy of the range of your pieces when you have a better position look for tactics to just completely crush your opponent when you liquidate the position um hopefully you can win kind of magnus style but not be magnus because even ikaro can't do that anyways yeah Again, here, opponent misplays a little bit, slight inaccuracy, Magnus pushes, develops fast and central squares, tactical traps, tactical traps, can take with the queen, now takes the center again, opens the files, a pin that's a potential x-ray that's a pin this is attacked takes with tempo just casually goes back maintaining idea of x-ray and the pin and quite activated pieces hit first open diagonals opponent can't castle two bishops running a mock it's the queen with tempo can't take because of this. 
now simply takes advantage of the pin. Pins the king. Hits the queen with tempo first. Tries to open the A file there. Threatening, of course, a pin. Sacrifices the rook. With tempo, you can't ignore, because after the exchange liquidates, and there you go, guys. The opponent resign actually after this. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Double piece. Happy chess improvement. See you guys later.